So it's 10.30. Welcome, everyone. This is the IMS medallion lecture. Uh, this is the, the, the one of the two medallion lectures for this GSM. Each year, eight medallion lectures are given across uh, all areas of statistics and probability by the IMS committee for special lecture. So medallion uh, nomination is a great honor and acknowledgement of a significant research contribution to one or more areas of research. So this year, one of our medallion award and the lecture is uh, Professor Judy Wong. So let me give you a little bit of introduction of uh, uh, Judy. Uh, Professor Judy Wong uh, received her PhD in statistics from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2006 under supervision of Professor Xu Minghe. So I'm also original uh, from UIUC, so I feel really fortunate, also honored to introduce Judy today. Uh, she was a faculty member in the Department of Statistics at North Carolina State University from 2006 to 2014. She's currently professor and also department chair of statistics department at the George Washington University. And Judy received many uh, distinguished honors, including a very prestigious NSF career award uh, and also the Treaty, MS Treaty New Research, New Research Award in 2012 and 2018. I mean, Career Award in 2012 and Treaty is uh, 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 yeah, around that time. Um, she, in, in 2018, she was also elected uh, ASA Fellow and also MS Fellow, same year, okay? And since 2018, Judy has, serving, has been serving as a program director in the Division of Mathematical Science, D DMS of National Science Foundation. I'm pretty sure some of you also receive um, um, uh, NSF awards through the Judy's uh, handling, okay? So she's managing uh, disciplinary programs in DMS, as well as a number of interdisciplinary programs that are cross direct, uh, directorate and across agency. So she has been serving as associate editor for Annals of Statistics, JASA, and Banuni and other journals. And she also served on various committee of statistics society, uh, such as the COPS uh, committee. Okay, so without, uh, Judy, I, was, I also need to give you the Medallion Medal. Okay, so Medallion is also a very special lecture. And this is IMS Medallion Medal. And uh, with your name uh, on it. Okay, so I turn the floor to uh, Professor Judy Wong. Judy, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, for the very nice introduction and for organizing and chairing this session. And I want to thank everyone to show up today uh, to come to my session. And thank you for your support. I want to thank the MS uh, Special Lecture Selection Committee for selecting me to give this lecture is a huge honor. Uh, and I really want to thank the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Uh, I'm, I feel very fortunate and also very proud to be a lifetime member of MS. Um, I feel that I made a good decision after I started my career in 2006, I decided to become a lifetime member of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And throughout my career in the past 16 years, I have benefited so much through the activities, events organized by MS, including the MS New Researcher Conference. I received so much guidance, inspirations of other members from this uh, institute, uh, so um, thank you, MS. 
Uh, you have helped me grow in my research and in my career from so many different dimensions and aspects. So if you are a student or a young researcher who is not a MS member yet, I would highly encourage you to become a member and uh, it will be a wonderful journey to grow together with the society and be a part of it. All right, so today is really my honor to uh, share with you uh, some recent developments, including some of my, my work and other colleagues' works on extreme conditional quantiles. Right, so I'll first give a brief introduction about connections of extreme events and the quantiles and why we want to study, estimate, and conduct inference regarding conditional extreme quantiles. And then I'm going to give a brief overview of extreme value theory and the quantile regression. Those are two major tools I'm going to introduce that when they combine, they can solve important questions in this area. And then I'm going to talk about different ways, uh, some semi-parametric approaches to handle the problem, answer the questions by combining extreme value theory and the quantile regression to uh, solve estimation and prediction problems for different types of distributions and considering different type of quantile regression models. And I will, at the end, open the floor for discussion of some other challenges and uh, future directions. All right, so extreme events are those events that are rare, unexpected, but could have a huge societal impact or consequences. They may harm um, people or cause environmental or other financial damages. Uh, for example, the Hurricane Doreen in 2019 um, has led to extreme rainfalls that uh, caused more than Eight, meet, eight billion financial damages, and uh, more than 60 people died from the hurricane, and, and also a many uh, more people are missing uh, from the hurricane. And also in 2003, there was a historical rec record of heat wave in uh, Europe. Um, many countries in Europe experienced the highest temperature over 500 years. Um, and more than 30 people's lives were taken away because of the heat wave. And just last month, there was another heat wave that had affected many places in the United States and, and in Europe. Um, so those are all events that do not happen often, but once they, ha uh, they happen, they could cause a lot of damages to the society. There are also many other examples in different fields that are uh, extreme events, uh, not only environmental, environmental uh, senses, including wind speeds of um, hurricanes, heavy snows, um, and solar or extreme solar flares, and large financial or in, uh, insur insurance claims, and large financial shocks. So those are all examples of extreme events that could have serious societal impact. Um, and recently, there have been a lot of um, attentions uh, due to the concerns regarding climate change. You probably also have seen a lot of news um, articles discussing uh, those topics, and questions that are often asked by the public are, are those extreme events, for instance, extreme um, weather events becoming more frequent or more severe? Are they connected with climate change? So I'll show you, and that there have been some numerical evidence that showed that in certain areas, geographical locations, there are evidence that extreme events are becoming more frequent, becoming more severe, and those uh, are several papers, including one collaborative work uh, I did with an uh, 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 atmospheric scientist uh, that showed those patterns by using statistical tools, especially extreme value theory, and uh, some were using quantile regression. 
So for those extreme events, it's very important to be able to provide a more accurate way to quantify the risk and predict an extreme event. Because this can help the society to be better prepared of those advent events so that we can minimize the damage and save lives. And just last week when I searched, there was an article, Discovery, uh, Discovery Science, uh, it is about how researchers develop AI tools that helped to predict extreme weather and to save lives. So our main focus uh, here is try to talk about different ways to model and predict extreme events. As you can see that extreme events are often happening on the tails of the distribution. So to predict and model those extreme events, it's more important to model the tail behaviors of those random processes, those distributions, instead of the central summaries such as a mean or median. Right. So I'm going to show you one example of data that we analyzed before. This is motivated by a statistical downscaling study to study the extreme rainfall. And in this data set, our, our response variable is a local observed daily precipitation based on historical data. And the predictors are simulate, simulated uh, outcomes uh, from global climate model, which provide a long-term forecast prediction, but at a low spatial resolution. So there is some misalignment between the observed precipitation data and those uh, reanalysis data coming from global climate models. So one goal of statistical downscaling is try to establish a relationship between the local scale historical observation and the large scale predictions coming from those global climate model so that we can do a better job using those uh, real analysis variables and global climate model output to predict the rare event um, in the future regarding extreme precipitation. So for such a type of data, some questions, natural questions people often ask is what is the 100 year return level? which means the extreme rainfall or precipitation level that is not observed with less than one out of 100 year probability. And another question is how can we quantify the chance or the risk? For instance, what is the probability that given our uh, outcome or uh, from the global climate model prediction? What is the chance that in the certain, the real observed the future uh, precipitation level will be exceeding a high level such that 30 inches. Right. So our main objective is to conduct inference regarding the extreme conditional quantiles, taking into account the predictor information that can help us to do a better job with the prediction. So, the mathematical notation we're using here is we're using y to denote the response variable of interest. x are those predictors which could be multidimensional. And we're interested in the tau n's conditional quantity of the response to given predictor. And this tau n approaches to one to the right tail of the distribution as sample size goes to infinity. And the average number of observations exceeding this quantile level can be very small can be even smaller than one, which means that we don't even observe any single data point in this tail region. So this causes challenges. When we have no data in this region, how can we quantify the risk? How can we estimate the probability? So we need to extend the empirical distribution beyond the available data. So this is the biggest challenge. Another challenge is how can we account for multivariate or multiple covariates? So I uh, want to say that um, I, w I started my career at North Carolina State University in the Triangle area. Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, have this, to be in the very rich research, uh, rich environment. So in 2007, 
I first encountered extreme value theory uh, through participating the uh, program organized by SAMC on risk analysis, extreme events, and decision theory. And I listened to the inspiring tutorial given by Professor Richard Smith that opened a new door to me and got me to learn about extreme value theory and I got to know this exciting mathematical theory and the tools that set the mathematical foundation for us to model the tail behavior and also provide us um, mathematical justification for extrapolation, extrapolating to the area that we do not observe data. So I want to now talk up a little bit about uh, uh, extreme value theory and how that could help us solve those challenging questions. And as we all know, central limit theorem is a very popular tool that quantifies and characterizes the limiting distribution of sample mean. And extreme type of theorem are theorems that quantify the limiting distribution of maximum statistics uh, corresponding to those extreme events. So this extremal type of theorem go, uh, goes back to 1928 by Fisher and the Tippett. They found out, found out that if the maximum statistic after some standardization normalization, if it converges to a non-degenerate distribution, and then this limiting distribution must belong to one of the so-called generalized extreme value distribution family. And if this is true, we'll say that the distribution um, of the data uh, where the random variable falls into the maximum domain of attraction. And in this generalized extreme value distribution family, a very important parameter is this gamma parameter that's called, we call it extreme value index that quantifies the heaviness of the tail distribution. Uh, so, uh, there are three different types of uh, distributions depending on the sign of this gamma. Gamma larger than zero correspond to the fresh type and those distributions with long tails and heavy tails. Um, and the, this first theorem um, provides a foundation of the convergence limiting distribution of maximum statistics and another very commonly used result in dream value theory is that if the random variable falls into the maximum domain of attraction, that is the maximum statistic after normalization does converge to a non-degenerate distribution, then if we look at the raw data on the original scale, look at those high values, large values over, exceed, uh, over a high threshold, and we call those exceedances over a high threshold, if this U is very large value, close to the upper bound of the distribution, then the exceedance over this high threshold, conditional on that the random variable is larger than the threshold, has also a limiting distribution. It can be approximated by this called generalized Pareto distribution family. Right. So that to, that to two different type of uh, um, uh, work that can help us to perform regression to take into account the covariate information. And the one is to fit our generalized extreme value regression um, by using block maximum data. And those lead to a sequence of research um, uh, based on block maximum analysis. Um, so to incorporate the covariate information, we can assume that those parameters of general extreme value distribution after some transformation, say are linear functions of the predict predictors. There are also some research assuming uh, some semi-parametric uh, assumptions or relationships. And similarly, if we analyze exceedance over a threshold or peaks over a threshold, we can also fit a generalized appraisal distribution modeling the parameters as parametric or semi-parametric functions and uh, uh, covariates. Uh, however, both of those approaches are sort of parametric approaches in the sense that they are based on those asymptotic extreme distributions, which may not work so well if, unless we have very large data set. 
So I'm going to discuss some recent developments of semi-parametric approaches by combining extreme value theory and quantile regression. And extreme value theory will help us to characterize different tail behaviors. It can help us build the foundation and uh, come up, uh, build the, the, the ground for reasonable extrapolations. And the methods I'm going to discuss do not rely on the generalized extreme value or generalized appraisal distribution limit, limiting distributions. Instead, oftentimes we're only assuming weaker first, first order and second order conditions, which I'm going to explain briefly, shortly. Um, and quantile regression is a semi-parametric approach that can help us to directly model the conditional quantiles of the response given predictors, you know, and it does not assume any parametric distribution assumptions. So this is a, a semi-parametric approach. And it can help us to quantify intermediate quantiles in the region that is close to the tail, but we still have a decent amount of data to predict to uh, provide reasonable estimates in the tail region, and we call intermediate quantile, but now uh, close to the extreme quantile. So using quantile regression, we can get some fairly decent estimation at intermediate region, and then we are going to use those uh, and combine with extreme value theory to quantify the, and quantify the tail behavior and then perform e extrapolation. Instead of Using block maximum data, um, the method I'm going to discuss will focus on uh, exceedance over high threshold because those approaches will contain more information. So let me give you a brief introduction of quantile regression for those who are not familiar with it. And we're not all familiar with uh, least squares regression. If we consider this a simple linear regression model, least squares regression models how the conditional mean of the response depends on a predictor. Well, quantile regression models how the conditional quantile of the response um, changes with a predictor. And in this simple linear quantile regression model, we have intercept alpha tau and the slope of beta tau, and they are quantile specific. And the beta tau can be explained as a marginal change in the tau's quantile of the response due to marginal change in x. So as you see that, it provides a direct way for us to model the conditional quantile. Um, however, there are limitations of directly using quantile regression approaches to estimate at extreme tails. Okay. If we have a random sample, xi and yi, and for a, simple, a linear quantile regression model, and we can estimate them, those coefficients, by minimizing our so-called um, check function, or asymmetric R1 loss function. For least squares regression, we can estimate the coefficients by minimizing sum of squared loss. And for quantile regression, we minimize this asymmetric R1 loss function, which puts a different weight to uh, positive residuals and negative residuals depending on the quantile level of interest. So if tau is half, we assign equal weights, and this will be reduced to the R1 loss function and leading to uh, the median regression. Um, however, even though quantile regression provides a direct way to model the conditional quantile, and in the tail area when we have uh, less data, uh, sparse data, uh, the, those direct quantile regression estimations tend to be unstable and not accurate as a tail. So that's why we need to borrow ideas and borrow um, uh, those, those um, extreme value theor theory tools to help us all right, so I'm going to start with discussing our uh, heavy-tailed distribution uh, with extreme value index uh, to be positive to show you how we can use extreme value theory to help perform extrapolation and quantify the tail behavior. Uh, so I will first start with a univariate case when there are no predictors to, um, uh, to illustrate. Our heavy-tailed distributions are those distributions where tails are heavier than exponential. And some examples include the Pareto distribution, 
uh, Cauchy distribution, log gamma distribution, et cetera. They're often used in applications, including log returns and exchange rate returns in finance, insurance claims, and damages from natural disasters. And because the tails are heavy, and we often observe some very extreme large values, it's a, uh, low frequency. So it is very difficult and challenging to estimate extreme quantiles in the tail area with limited data. All right, so I mentioned earlier the extremal theorem. It says that some distributions, their maximum statistic after normalization could converge to a non-degenerate uh, distribution. But what are the conditions to ensure that this theorem hold? And, and the, the most, the one sufficient and necessary condition is this extreme value condition, or we call the first order condition. It says if there is a positive function A, such that limit of this ratio is our a power function of X, and then the distribution will fall into the domain of uh, the maximum domain of attraction. That is the maximum statistic after normalization will converge to the, um, uh, the, the GV distribution family. And Dehan and uh, Ferreira, the, their book, also discussed uh, um, many equivalent necessary and sufficient conditions for distribution to belong to the domain of attraction for different scenarios. So for heavy tail type of distribution with the gamma to be positive, gamma equals zero, corresponding to a low light tail distribution such as the Gaussian distribution, and also gamma uh, to be negative. So those, the, the extreme value condition, first order condition, and also those equivalent sufficient necessary conditions uh, set the foundation, can help us to come up with estimation methods to estimate this extreme value index. And that is a key for extrapolation. All right, so, and for heavy tailed distributions, they're um, listing two equivalent to sufficient necessary conditions for distribution to fall into the maximum domain of attraction. So the first one states that the survival function decays at power rate at the tail. And the second is exceedance of log, uh, uh, expectation the log exceedance uh, converged to the, uh, expect, uh, the extreme value distribution. So if we use the second sufficient and necessary condition, this can help us motivate, this motivated this most uh, popular estimator called Hue estimator for heavy detailed distributions. So we want, exceed, we want a high threshold T, then the mean of the log exceedance over this high threshold will converge to gamma. So we can pick our large order, uh, upper order statistic as our T. For instance, the N minus the case order statistic. And then we look at all the values above this threshold and then calculate the sample mean of those exceedance over that order statistic. That this is the Hill estimator, which has been widely used in many applications. As you see that to quantify the tail behavior, Outer, upper order statistics play essential roles. So this is univariate extreme value theory. Now, if we are talking about multivariate or regression setup, we just need to find out how to uh, come up with ways to, uh, to quantify the or, or uh, get some proxy of those upper order statistics from the conditional distribution. All right, so how can we use extreme value theory to do extrapolation? The, this is the, the first uh, equivalent sufficient and necessary condition I just showed you. The survival function decays at a power rate in the tail. And our interest is extreme quantile at quantile level tau n uh, with n times one minus tau n that may approach it to our small constant uh, or even zero. And from this condition we, that we can come up with extrapolation uh, so X is at intermediate quantile level, and we multiply someone T that is larger than one that can help us to go to a further tail of the distribution. 
So based on this condition, we can come up with this extrapolation. Extrapolating from this Q tau at the quantile level tau, it is also on the tail. It goes to one as sample size go to infinity, but n times one minus tau also go to infinity. That is, we still have a decent amount of data uh, in this intermediate quantile region to help us uh, get a reasonable estimation. And then we extrapolate from this uh, tau location to a further extreme tail, extreme quantile level tau n. All right, so I just uh, talk, uh, explained how universe extreme value theory can help us uh, quantify the chance at the extreme tail. And then you may think, why don't we just uh, apply univariate extreme value theory to regression setup? Um, the challenge is if the predictors are multidimensional or the predictor is continuous, then we do not have enough upper order statistics corresponding to uh, our each or given single value of covariate. Because we need to model the tail behavior of the conditional distribution. Uh, of y given x. So we may not have enough data at every x. So our main idea is we can, when we do not have data, what should, we, what should we do? It's like when we do not have money, we borrow from the bank. Right? When, when we have our lack of data, we try to borrow information from other areas. Right? In regression setup, we can try to borrow information across x space. So that um, so this is our main idea. We are going to use a quantile regression to borrow information by fitting regression and borrow information across the prediction space, predictor space, and then construct a pseudo tail order statistics um, corresponding to the conditional distribution. And then we use extreme value theory to model the tail behavior and perform extrapolation. Um, so how does this work? And I want to show you some equivalence between quantile regression process and data generation. And we teach this to our undergraduate students how to generate data from our distribution, uh, say a, a univariate distribution. And you generate a random uh, variable from a uniform distribution zero and one, and you invert the CDF, and you let Y, define Y to be the use quantile, that's F inverse U, which is used quantile of the distribution, and you repeat this procedure, you get a random sample coming from this distribution. Right? So we can, if we know our quantile process, the entire quantile uh, function, this can help us generate the data coming from a distribution. So for, if we want to generate the data coming from a conditional distribution, conditional on a predictor, the same idea, if we know the entire quantile process, they, then this can help to generate the data. Right. So if we consider this is simple linear quantile regression process, um, assuming the task quantile of the response is a linear function of the predictor across for quantile level between zero and one, and if we want to generate data, we generate a uniform, first we, gen, we, we, we for a given x, we generate uniform random variable between zero and one, and then we let a y to be the use conditional quantile uh, of Y given the predictor, which is expressed by, captured by the quantile process coefficients. All right. So this inspired us because of this equivalence between quantile process and data generation. We can fit quantile regression on the right tail. We don't have to fit quantile regression across entire quantile level between zero, zero one only on the right tail. And then we can estimate the conditional quantile function in the tail area, and that can serve as a proxy or pseudo upper order statistics uh, co corresponding to that conditional distribution, and those can help us characterize the tail behavior of this conditional distribution. All right. So the first approach I'm going to introduce is based on this idea uh, by fitting a linear quantile regression tail process. So we consider some uh, a grid of upper quantile levels um, uh, on the right, right tail, and then we use a fit linear quantile regression model to estimate intermediate con conditional quantile functions at those intermediate quantile levels. 
and then those will are going to use those um, and uh, use them as a pseudo upper order statistics. And remember I mentioned earlier the Hue estimator is basically the expectation of log exceedance of those upper order statistics. Since now we have those pseudo upper order statistics corresponding to the conditional distribution, and we use them and take the average of after log transformation log exceedance, and this will give us a hue type estimator for the extreme value index, which may depend on the predictors. And then we adopt the same extrapolation idea to extrapolate from this conditional quantile at intermediate quantile level to the far tail to estimate extreme conditional quantile. All right, so some remarks about this approach. The, why it works? Because at intermediate quantile level, with the average number of observations when n go to infinity still goes to infinity. So that we can still get a fairly accurate estimation at those quantile levels. And we can still theoretically get asymptotic representation, asymptotic normality of those intermediate con uh, conditional quantile estimation. So those are going to help us uh, is establish the limiting representation for the hue type extreme value index estimator and the extrapolated estimator for the extreme conditional quantiles. There is one practical issue because we are trying to obtain the upper order statistics from a conditional distribution. Those upper order statistics should be increasing with the quantile level, but we are fitting a quantile regression using finite sample to estimate at those uh, grid, uh, this grid of quantile levels. So monotonicity is not always guaranteed uh, from the numerical study. So in some applications, especially when there is a lack of data or there is a violation of model assumption because we're fitting linear quantile regression or some other parametric or a regression form as approximation. So when there is a lack of data or violation of model assumption, we may encounter the quantile crossing issue that is the upper uh, quantile function may be estimated to be even smaller than the lower quantile function. So this is also another issue in quantile regression and I want to refer to one of the earlier works that we did that we can uh, conduct uh, joint estimation across the quantile levels, the grid of quantile levels, and add constraints to ensure uh, the monotonicity of quantile estimates. Okay. And some other remarks is I mentioned earlier that the extreme value index parameter is very crucial, but it's very difficult to estimate. Um, so when we, for this work based on linear quantile regression, uh, linear quantile process and extreme value theory. And to establish a theoretical property, we did have to assume that the conditional distribution are tail equivalent across predictors. Um, however, the method we uh, pr provided, um, the estimator, is covariate specific. So this, if this extreme value index parameter is indeed a common, what we can do is to get a put estimator by taking the average of the um, covariate specific extreme value index estimation. And there is advantage to obtain covariate specific estimation because this can help us to do some um, diagnosis to check whether extreme value index indeed is a constant or it varies with predictors. Um, so it can also help us to see the pattern if it tends to be dependent on the covariate, so what's the relationship? So this can help us provide some guidance for parametric modeling of the extreme value uh, index function. Of course, there were also many other approaches for heavy tilled distributions to estimate the extreme uh, quantiles or extreme conditional quantiles. So here I listed some other uh, researchers' work. So if 
Uh, one of your works is not included here. I apologize for overlooking uh, your work, so please reach out and let me know so in the future I can make sure I, uh, my list of reference will be more comprehensive. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that when we have lack of data, we need to, the only thing we can do is either post reasonable assumptions, modeling assumptions, distributional assumptions, or we try to borrow information, uh, com share, try to identify commonality so that we can borrow the commonality and try to borrow information from other areas to provide a more accurate estimation. Right, so uh, in the approach I introduced is based on modeling the conditional quantile functions, for instance, linear quantile function. In some applications, we found out that as a tail region, the quantile coefficient may be, be, appear to be constant in the tail region. So the beta tau tend to be a constant for tau larger than a certain value. Then what we can do is we can try to borrow this commonality information in our estimation and estimate this common parameter by combining information from the tail region from multiple quantile levels. So one way to do that is to consider this composite quantile estimator by minimizing a combined check loss function corresponding to different quantile levels um, so that we can share information across those quantile levels and this will lead to a more efficient estimation for the slope parameter in the tail region. And in order to get a more optimal estimator, we can also assign different weights to different quantile levels. Right. So how to determine the optimal weight? Uh, when, uh, I worked with one of my former uh, PhD student from uh, North Carolina State uh, to study this problem. And we also we did, did, uh, found out that for intermediate quantile levels, the optimal weight only depend on the extreme value index. There are some clear patterns depending on whether extreme value index is positive, zero, or negative. So we also provided some estimation approaches to estimate those optimal weights to, um, and we showed this will give more efficient estimation for the composite estimator. So if this assumption is true, the quantile slope is a constant at the tail region and we want to estimate extreme conditional quantiles so that motivated another idea uh, that is after we estimate this common slope parameter on the right tail and then we can define those uh, pseudo residuals by subtracting the effect of the covariate from the response. So then the residual will mimic the, the tail behavior of the residual and this is a shown in, was shown in our paper the, those, the tail behavior of the residual will mimic uh, or asymptotically behave similarly with those of the conditional uh, or the distribution for the inter intercept uh, quantile function process. Right. Then we can use those upper order statistics of those pseudo residual, again, apply univariate extreme value theory to quantify the tail behavior, estimate the extreme value index, and then perform extrapolation um, by adding back the impact uh, of the predictor uh, back to the extrapolation. So our recommendation is in practice, check whether there is any commonality at the tail region. If the quantile slope would tend to be constant to not to vary much in the tail region, um, we are better off to use the common slope approach. All right, let me come back to this example, the downscaling of precipitation. Uh, just to remind everyone, uh, we want to build a relationship between the local climate conditions based on historical rainfall data and the coarser resolution predictions from the global climate models. And the data set we analyzed include uh, 40, 46 years of data and we only focus on those wet days when there were rain, there were rainfall, so the uh, precipitation level is um, above zero. Uh, so we looked at, I'm going to show you the data analysis from two stations, 
uh, Aurora Station and the Midway Station, uh, Midway Airport Station in Chicago area. And the predictor, we only considered one predictor that is a simulated precipitation from the reanalysis model, the global climate uh, model. So we want to use, uh, try to build this relationship and try to predict the rare event of extreme high precipitation based on the course resolution and the long-term forecast from the climate models. All right. So here is a scatter plot of the data. Um, and the lines correspond to the feet from standard quantile regression at the different quantile levels. So we, this table showed us the estimated conditional quantile at those high quantile levels uh, at x equals 0.04. Right. Uh, and here, those three stars are the estimation based on our approach using dream value theory and the quantile regression we call EXRQ at uh, x equals roughly 0.02, 0 0.03, and 0.04. So when we look at tau equals 99.99%, this is very high quantile level, that corresponds to 100 year return. That's a level that does not, ha that happens with less than one out of 100 year uh, probability. So if we look at the, our estimation at 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, those are the, the estimation of the 100 year return uh, at those predictor values. Do you see any problems? Observe. Yeah, we observed something bigger, right? Thank you very much. You see, you, you see there is a single really high precipitation level. That is, we looked at it, it's 16.91 inches. That happened in, I think, 1976. Um, so I mentioned that we studied the data, including data of 46 years of wet day. That corresponds, this value, if I do calculation, corresponds to 99.98%. Why our estimation for 99.99% based on extreme value theory is smaller than 16.91? So this may indicate that extreme value theory is not working well, right? That's not help us to quantify this rare event or predict this rare event. So we were also very puzzled at the beginning. And then later, I thought, let's look at the historical data, really look what happened in Aurora Station area. So we looked at the records of uh, precipitation extremes in Aurora Station. And then on this website, I found a longer period of data, historical data that covers 120 years. Within this 120 years, the largest precipitation observed in history is that single point that we just saw, 16.91 inches. It happened in 1996, uh, July uh, 18th. So even though we analyzed data for a shorter period of time, only 46 years, but this large value 16.9 is really one of the 120 year event that was observed in the history. So that is larger than our, this 99.99%, the 100 year level that we targeted. Uh, so that explains our estimation is not doing, uh, it's doing a pretty good job actually using dream value theory to quantify the chance of this rare event. However, if we just use a standard quantum regression, fitting a regression law, we're using there's another approach that's a tail index regression by modeling, by fitting our Pareto uh, distribution and modeling the, the parameter as a function the extreme value index parameter as a function of the predictors, they give over prediction, huge uh, um, prediction for the 100 year return. The standard quantile regression gives an estimation of 25 inches. And the other approach 
gives estimation of 89 inches. So just based on what I showed you, I hope that I can convince you that those estimations are over uh, estimating the extreme event. Right. So another example is so we looked at the midway station data. I just want to show you that for this data, it shows if we fit linear quantile regression and those quantile levels. What do you see, the pattern that you see? Some showed upward trend, which is reasonable because the real analysis variable, also larger value, indicates higher chance of heavier precipitation. But if you look at 99.99 percentile, if we feed the quantile regression, it shows a downward trend, right? The, the quantile functions are also crossing with, with, with each other. So the consequence is, if we just feed a standard quantile regression model, the upper quantile will be estimated to be smaller than the lower quantile. So it won't, and, and in this case, it gives uh, underestimation of those extreme precipitation. All right, so I just used a heavy tail distribution to, um, uh, as example to show everyone how extreme value theory and combined with quantile regression can help us uh, estimate the conditional extreme quantiles and quantify the risk uh, of rare e events when there are some predictor information. The extrapolation, the whole idea works by using quantile regression to estimate intermediate quantile, uh, conditional quantile functions when we still have a decent amount of data in that area. And then we use extra value theory to quantify the tail behavior and perform extrapolation. And extreme value theory is a very useful tool that can set a foundation and tell us how to do extrapolation. And the extrapolation, of course, will depend on the tail behavior. Here I'm uh, including the uh, quantile functions of three different types of distribution correspond to heavy tail distributions with the gamma positive and gumbo distribution, gamma equals zero and negative gamma. And you can see that the quantile functions decay at the tail at a very different rate, a different behavior in the tail area. So how we do extrapolation depends on the tail behavior. Right? Um, so I'm, next I'm going to uh, show you how we can do extrapolation use extreme value theory to conduct analysis uh, for other type of, of tail, uh, tail distributions. And one is what if we don't know whether the distribution is heavy tailed or it is a short tailed or light tailed. Uh, there are approaches that we can conduct analysis of, uh, for extreme value index belong to be our real number. So it includes all three uh, scenarios. And again, I need to revisit the first order condition that ensures the existence of convergence, distribution convergence on maximum statistic. Okay. So under this first order condition, uh, if we let T to be the ratio of the sample size and uh, K is our uh, uh, upper order, order statistical level, and then let X to be this value related to the extreme quantile level of interest, based on this first order condition, we can, if we know the normalizing function AT, we can um, have our formula a way to conduct extrapolation for general cases without relying on the first order condition for heavy tail, um, assuming a heavy tail distribution. So this will give us our general another way of extrapolation. Um, and we also need to come up with an estimation of the extreme value in, uh, index for general cases. Uh, one way, one type of estimator is commonly used in uh, the field is this moment estimator. And you can Compose this gamma can be positive or can be negative, but you can write it as two parts, a positive part and the negative part. And the positive part, we can estimate it by Hill estimator. So this is the first moment, MN1, and the second part, the, the negative part, can be estimated by this 
uh, um, function of the second moment. The first moment is just uh, the sample mean of the log exceedance over a high threshold, the higher order statistics. And MN2 is just a square, the second moment, sample means, a sample moment of this log exceedance. Uh, there are, besides this moment estimator, there are also Pekin's estimator that depends on several quantile levels. Later, there are also modifications or generalizations of Pekin's estimator or refined Pekin's uh, estimator and refined um, uh, Hughes estimator. Um, so we also looked at uh, the gamma equals zero case so those correspond to viable tail uh, distributions. Um, so those are corresponding to a wide class of light tailed distributions in the gumball maximum domain of attraction with extreme value index equals zero. Um, so there, there are some examples, for instance, Gaussian distribution, gamma distribution, Weibull, and extended Weibull distribution. They all belong to this Weibull tail distribution type. They also have a, a lot of applications in insurance, hydrology, environmental sciences, et cetera. So what is the Weibull type of distribution? And the heavy tail distribution, the tail, decays, the, the survival function decays at a power rate. And for Weibull type of distribution, we look at the cumulative hazard, which is negative log of the survival function. The cumulative hazard function decays at a power rate. And the rate is called Weibull tail coefficient theta. Um, so because of, of the time limit, I do not want to go through those technical details. But based on the assumption of this uh, uh, and also the uh, uh, characteristic of the tail, the viable type of tail behavior, we can also come up with ways to estimate the viable type of coefficient in regression setup um, and perform extrapolation to extreme uh, levels. So for heavy tail distribution, if you still remember uh, the formula I showed you earlier, extrapolation depends on the power function of the ratio of how far the quantile level is away from one. Uh, and here is based on the log ratio of the quantile levels. So the, what I wanted to, to say by looking at the different uh, tail behavior is, to, uh, is just to want to show you that the extrapolation needs to be reasonable. The model assumptions that we use need to be reasonable to fit into the data. And so the extreme value theory provides us as a foundation to come up with a different types of or form of extrapolation according to the tail behavior of different data and the different distributions. And we also used the quantile regression to help estimating the extreme, the intermediate quantile level. But uh, I only so far showed you linear quantile regression models. Now a natural question is what if linear RT does not hold? Um, of course, we, many people here uh, uh, studying non-parametric statistics and you know we can consider non-parametric regression but everyone also is aware of the challenge of non-parametric regression due to the curse of dimensionality. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about several uh, other approaches, the work that we have done that tries to generalize and consider more flexible distributions. Um, so one is based on transforming the quantile regression model. I will also briefly talk about our work on quantile autoregression for analyzing time series data. Okay, in our, our one, uh, 2013 paper, we have this interesting uh, finding that is if we're considering extreme value, uh, considering heavy tailed distribution, if we assume the linear quantile function holds, the linear RT holds as the tail areas, the in all the air areas of quantile levels above this level tau C, and if the response variable conditional distribution does fall into this maximum domain of attraction, the linear quantile assumption at the tail region ensures that the extreme value index must be a constant. 
So which means that if we want more flexibility to analyze the data or applications where extreme value index depend on predictors, for instance, depend on location or depend on time, then we have to consider more flexible functions rather, or, or models rather than linear quantile regression model. Right? But as I said, the non-parametric quantile regression is more flexible, uh, it, it has a limitation uh, to handle uh, higher dimensional predictors. However, we also have a funding that uh, even if the extreme value index may depend on predictors, if we have certain transformation, perform transformation on the response variable, the transformed data, the variable, uh, may still fall into the domain of maximum attraction with a constant extreme value index. So with, when it's common, then we can again borrow information and get more accurate estimation for the extreme value index. So this motivated us to consider a transformed quantile regression model by performing a transformation to the response variable. This also is linked to a single index model I'm going to explain shortly. All right. So first we consider a power transformation to the response variable and we assume that after the power transformation, the linear RT assumption holds. Uh, and because Quantile has this nice feature that is equivalent to monotone transformation, that is the Quantile of the transformed variable is, sim is uh, simply the uh, inverse function of the transformation of the uh, Quantile function on, on the original scale. Right. So due to this equivalence, then assuming the transform the Y has a linear quantile function, then the quantile function of Y on, on the original scale can be easily obtained by inverting the transformation matrix. And here, the transformation is parametric. It determined, it's determined by this transformation parameter lambda. And then we can estimate this lambda by minimizing a lack of linearity uh, measurement. Um, of course, there is a question, right? When we use extreme value theory to quantify the characteristic, should we model work on the raw scale or work on the transformation scale? You can do either way, but it's more complicated to work on the transformation scale because there's some connection between the extreme value index on the original scale and on the transformed scale. So, uh, and our recommendation is to work on the raw scale, but because of this equivalence of quantile to model transformation, we can always transform back and then model and estimate the, the quantile function at intermediate quantile level on the transformed scale first, then transform back to the raw scale and then use that to characterize the tail behavior and perform extrapolation on the raw scale. And we also talk about how connections between the two extreme value index on the raw scale and on the transformer scale can help us to select the tuning parameter that is the level, intermediate quantile level, where we start with extrapolation. This is also very important tuning parameter. There have been a lot of studies how to select this tuning parameter in the optimal way because it really balances between bias and variance. And if we consider more, a bigger region in the tail area, we have more data and the variance will be small, but then the, the bias due to approximation of extreme value theory will be larger. So it, it, it is important how to come up with a good choice of this tuning parameter. Okay, uh, this, the funding I just talk about also motivated us to consider this single index model. That is, we're assuming that the conditional quantile function of Y as a tail region is a linear function of the predictor after a non-parametric or unknown link transformation. Right, so this G tau is unknown link function uh, which will be estimated non-parametrically. It may depend on the quantile level. And we also have a single index characterized by this single index parameter vector beta zero. So this single index model balances between model flexi uh, flexibility and parsimony. Um, 
uh, again, I want to emphasize that this model only assumes this assumption, model assumption, holds on the right tail, not the entire distribution. So this is a weaker assumption compared to some other uh, existing work in the literature of, uh, of single index model. All right. So consider this single index model on the tail region. And how we, first question is how do we estimate the index parameter beta zero? And we're using this result that is under some linearity assumption on the covariate. Then even the quantile function of the response is a nonlinear function of the predictors. However, if we simply just fit a misspecified linear quantile regression model, we can still consistently estimate the direction of the single index parameter vector. So this provides a very simple approach to estimate the index uh, by performing a linear, misspecified linear quantile regression at this uh, given fixed quantile level closer to the tail. And because this tau c is a fixed quantile level, we can still get a root n consistent estimation to estimate the directions of the single index parameter. And then once we know the single index and we can define it as z, then we can use non-parametric regression technique to estimate the nonlinear and unspecified link function g. And here we are using locally linear quantile regression to estimate this g function. And after that, and we're, we will be able to estimate the conditional intermediate conditional quantile functions, which are nonlinear function, non-parametric functions of the predictor, and use those as a pseudo, again, use them as a pseudo upper order statistics to, to characterize the tail behavior and extrapolate to estimate extreme conditional quantiles. Okay, um, I want to use maybe uh, only two minutes to talk about another work that we have done for auto uh, quantile regression model. Uh, so uh, here we consider a quantile auto regressive process, um, data generating process. And, uh, for the result that show that if the right hand side is a monotone increasing function in this level epsilon t, and epsilon t is like a quantile level random uniform random variables between zero and one. And then the conditional quantile of yt given observation at the previous time points will be a linear function, uh, linear quantile function. See, the behavior of this time series data yt is determined by those random coefficients beta that are varying functions of this uniform render variable, zero and one. Uh, so if we assume that, if we perform some transformation for the quantile coefficients and assume those random coefficients satisfy the first order and second order condition uh, in extreme value theory. And the first question we have is how does the behavior, the tail behavior of those random coefficients and what are connections of those tail behaviors with the tail behavior of our time series data, of the response distribution? And we have this funding that is if those random coefficients fall into the maximum domain of attraction and each coefficient has extreme value index gamma j and the second order parameter rho j, and then we found out the happiness of the response, the time series, is determined by the most heavy uh, the, the coefficients with the most heavy, beha heavy uh, tail behavior. That is, the index uh, of our y distribution is just the maximum of gamma j corresponding to these individual random coefficients. And we were also able to uh, quantify the decay behavior of the conditional distribution of the time series data. And in this work, we, are, we didn't assume that the distribution uh, are heavy-tailed or light-tailed, so uh, we came up with this moment type of estimator for the extreme value index uh, for the time series data and uh, uh, corresponding ways to estimate extreme conditional quantile. 
Uh, in another recent work, we also we consider um, a generalized hue estimator that can give more accurate estimation for um, heavy tilde distributions uh, for uh, time series data. And in that, this work, the asymptotic variance has a simple form, so we can use it directly to uh, quantify the uncertainty. So I hope this gives you uh, a picture of how extreme value theory together with quantile regression can help us to solve those uh, challenging questions to quantify the risk of rare events. Just uh, to recap, the main idea is to fit appropriate quantile regression models to estimate intermediate conditional quantiles, which will be uh, used as a serve as pseudo order statistics to help us capture the tail behavior and help us with the extrapolation. And the extrapolation is based on the tail behavior, uh, which is based on our model assumption, our understanding of the data. Um, so this is um, uh, justified by extreme value theory. Um, of course, we need to make reasonable assumptions on the tail behavior. The methods that I reviewed uh, can be regarded as semi-parametrical approaches because one, we borrow information from across quantile levels using, uh, across covariates using quantile regression technique which does not assume any parametrical distribution assumptions. And for the extreme value theory part, we only require second and the first order uh, conditions instead of assuming or using the limiting extreme distribution such as extreme, a generalized extreme value distribution or generalized Pareto distribution. Okay. So there are virtues and the limitations of those approaches, extreme value theory approaches, because they, we're really solving, trying to solve a very difficult problem, and we're trying to estimate in the area that we do not really observe data. Uh, and again, what can we do when there is a lack of data? Either we make reasonable mathematical assumptions on the tail model and use a theory, mathematical theory, to help us to extrapolate in a reasonable way, or think about how we can borrow information, utilize the commonality to help us but to analyze uh, data and estimate in the region we don't, do not observe the data by borrowing information from the regions we do have some bit of data. So I explained several ways. So one is to assume a common quantile slope at the tail, so this is one way. And regression is another way to borrow information across covariates. Now there are also a lot of uh, study of studying of extreme events in environmental studies by studying spatial data. And if there are commonality across a space, this can also provide uh, uh, ways or uh, tools for, for us to um, do a better job with estimation and prediction. As Professor Richard Smith said, there's always going to be an element of doubt because we're traveling into areas that we don't know about. But extreme value theory is making the best use of what we have in the data and, and to quantify and characterize uh, about extreme phenomena. There are challenges of those uh, research or developments. One, I already mentioned that the optimal threshold and how many, how, how much tail regions that should we use to quantify the tail behavior and do extrapolation. So in the regression setup also what, and for other more complicated scenarios, I know some re, uh, colleagues are working on graphical modeling and or spatial data, spatial temporal data. How can we select this optimal threshold, the tail sample fraction? This is an important and a challenging question. And how to deal with high dimensional data and the dependent data and try to also borrow information across the space, et cetera, or also some other challenges. So here I'm listing some uh, topics of future directions and I hope that we can have a dynamic uh, interactive discussion uh, regarding those directions. And for, for instance, I mentioned 
spatial data is very common in environmental uh, studies. But there are large spatial data, huge spatial data, and how can we come up with uh, scalable approaches to, to analyze large spatial data to, and deal with those computational challenges. And for data, again, spatial data, when there are non-stationarity, either in the location, in the scale, and the shape. How can we model such data using uh, different approaches? Okay. So one possibility is that I've been working with Lily uh, using bivariate spline. So this is something that we are going to explore further. And scale, look, uh, scalable approaches to accommodate spatial dependence, there are approaches by using maximum um, like press, uh, process um, and there, yeah, this is another area I'm interested in exploring and maybe using copula approach, you have done some work in this area or uh, try to learn new tools <laughs> to, to study uh, in those directions. And spatial heterogeneity could be very useful for us uh, to identify commonality across a space. Maybe extreme value index or the tail behavior is very different across the region, but common in the neighbor region. So if we can identify those homogeneity or heterogeneity, this can help us to borrow information from neighbors with a similar tail behaviors to do a better job with estimation or prediction. And again, borrow information from other data source, data sources. And uh, uh, there is, this is active research area in statistics uh, in recent years, uh, fusion learning, and how can we can fuse information and incorporate information from different data sources uh, to um, conduct a more accurate prediction. Uh, so there are many interesting open questions uh, and topics in this area. Uh, so in case some of our um, new researchers uh, are interested in this area, I certainly welcome you to explore in those directions. And certainly quantification, this is always a challenge. For likelihood-based approaches, if you assume GEV or uh, GPD distributions, we can use large sample theory or symptotic distribution for uncertain quantification. But uncertain quantification is more challenging for non-likelihood-based approaches that I discussed today. Um, even though we, we also have a symptotic theory that is that asymptotic distributions, but oftentimes asymptotic distribution either have very complicated forms or it requires some parameter, involves some parameters like the second order parameters that are quite difficult to estimate. So uh, how can we come up with alternative and computational feasible approaches for uncertain quantification and also to account accommodate, say, modest sample size. And there are some research in the literature um, uh, talking about uh, subsample bootstrap or using empirical likelihood to solve those uncertain quantification problem in extreme value theory uh, and base, basing methods. And also there's possibility maybe using perturbation ideas uh, to, um, to solve this, this problem. So basing is a natural way to uh, incorporate the prior information and uh, quantify, un uh, quantify uncertainty. However, in, for, in this context, and basing always we have to require a likelihood, a specification of the likelihood. And related to quantile regression, uh, there have been some studies on basing quantile regression. And uh, one important feature of quantile regression and connection is quantile regression, the loss function is connected, has a strong connection with this distribution called asymmetric Laplace distribution. Because the loss function, check loss function, is negative log of the likelihood of the asymmetric Laplace distribution. So due to this connection, there has been a lot of work assuming, focusing on quantile regression, but assuming our uh, working likelihood based on the asymmetrical Laplace distribution. So because the 
posterior mold based on this working likelihood is the same as the frequentist estimator by minimizing the quantile loss function. So this is a, a valid if the focus is on estimation, parameter estimation. There have been studies that provided a theoretical justification for the consistency of the Bayesian counterpart uh, based on the asymmetrical Laplace likelihood. However, this likelihood is just uh, our working likelihood, and it depends on the quantile level. It changes when tau changes. So if we're using the posterior uh, directly to con conduct um, inference or to, uh, to quantify uncertainty, there will be issues, will be bias. And we uh, have some work in this area, and we, we Mention for we look at some simpler cases, linear quantile regression model, and we found out that there is a way to adjust the posterior to make it valid uh, for basing posterior uh, basing analysis based on asymmetrical Laplace distribution. Um, but how to do the adjustment for more complicated scenarios? So this is an area that we haven't looked at yet. So some final words, and uh, Annie mentioned that in the past four years, I worked as a rotating program director at National Science Foundation. One of the review criteria for NSF proposals is broader impacts. So my four-year experience have taught me to look more closely, pay more attention to broader impacts. So this always have, uh, let me think how we can make a more impacts, not only in statistics, mathematical statistics, but going beyond. Let other people from other fields know about the work so that they can use the tools that we develop. And this is also motivated by my observation that when I looked at application, there are increasing number of applications of, of uh, using quantile regression to um, analyze the data and quantify those rare events in climate studies, the finance, environmental. But a lot of those work are based on simple application of a quantile regression to the tail area without using dream value theory. So I hope that we, I, uh, I can make more efforts in the future to connect with scientists from other areas, let them know our development, that know how extreme value theory can help and provide a better, more accurate estimation and risk uh, quantification in those application areas. And the final word is yeah, the importance of improving public literacy and letting people know what, how statistics can help us to save lives and uh, re reduce damages, right? So now I want to point it out to one podcast recently given by Professor Richard Smith on 100-year floods that was uh, hosted by one of the newest math institutes supported by National Science Foundation, MC, uh, located at University of Chicago. So if you haven't checked out the podcast, listen to the podcast, it was a very wonderful, enjoyable conversation in the layman language to explain to the public how statistics, issue value theory is connected to those hot topics related to climate change. Finally, I want to thank National Science Foundation for the support, my home department at George Washington University for all the support encouragement, my collaborators, I couldn't list all, and this is a partial list of my collaborators for the work that I reviewed, included today. There are also some other collab collaborators I couldn't uh, include all. And I also want to thank Piotr, I don't know whether he's here, for giving me very helpful constructive comments on the first draft of my slides. I want to thank my family for the support so that I can fully devote my time at GSM to prepare for this lecture. And thanks for my friends, former students, and the colleagues for all the support and encouragement. And of course, thank you everyone, single one of you, for being here and for your, uh, your attention.
thank you, uh, Judy, for the wonderful lecture. And now we come for the uh, for discussion. Any question for Judy? Are you working in this area, mathematical physics? I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar, so familiar with that area, uh, but I will look into it. And if any other audience, if, if you um, know any other relevant work in mathematical physics, anyone would like to share your thoughts? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Shelley. Yeah, because uh, in climate, uh, climate scientists, the, there are physics um, inspired, moti motivated, driven. Mo oh, the axis, uh, axis, because there are climate models um, that, that was based on physics, more physically driven models that simulate data. Mm -hmm. And then the actual precipitation were like, you know, yeah. zero to six. Yeah, yes. What, what was that zero point zero? That was just uh, the scale from a simulation model, a climate simulation model. They provide a simulation and based on physical models to forecast the precipitation. But the outcome from the climate model does not align with the real scale of precipitation that we observe in, his, in history data. Mm -hmm. and, and the reanalysis about should at least vaguely be on the same scale as the actual precipitation. And, and unfortunately, they are not because those are based on some physical models, and there are also different types of climate models. They will simulate. What are the units of your X's? Do the units of your X's inches of rain in a day? Yeah, the relative scale makes more, uh, more meaning here. So, a larger value of real analysis indicate a larger uh, precipitation, potential precipitation. Yeah, but hmm. um, any question from other audience? Yeah. later on as a future work, you did indicate, of course, one should maybe use a uh, bootstrap or whatever to get some measure of stability, but then you maybe even afterwards you claim that you overestimate, otherwise you just compare a point estimate with one data point. The mm -hmm. other point is, I think, you gave some detail on borrowing, that of course, at the end of the day, uh, that what one has to be very clear about, that if you do borrow from areas where the model is lower, but the uh, problem may come, especially climate models, that the observed observation moves to a point where the whole climate starts to behave completely differently. Yes. So by value, of course, you cannot borrow this because you have observations below this Y value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does, of course, it, it may help in some situations, but it has a huge risk that it's over-interpreted, but of course you cannot solve these problems if you don't have observations in this area. Thank you very much. Those are very, uh, uh, yeah, very helpful comments, right? So in the previous downscaling example that we should have uh, taken into consideration the uncertainty, and because at that time we, it was extreme, the limited distribution was really difficult to work with it directly, so I haven't tried those bootstrap approaches to uh, quantify the uncertainty, but as I mentioned, this is something that I plan to work on in the next few years. Um, and the second, um, 
yeah, the, the, uh, the second comment, I agree with you. So what information can we borrow really depend on the, the, the data. And sometimes we may also rely on the experts' opinions and what they know based on the, the, the past studies. So the borrowed information part really have to based on those homogeneity assumption whether it is reasonable. And sometimes things change dynamically, right? So across time, there are a lot of time series of data. So how to model that dynamic, dynamic modeling and quantify how things change the pattern. This is also a very important thing to, to consider, especially related to climate change, where you really have to do dynamic modeling to, to understand the pattern, the trend across time. And but whenever, if there is a tendency that we see their homogeneity or common information, and this is something we can think about, is it possible to borrow information? Yeah, I see Shali has a raise her hand. Well, thank you, uh, Judy, for a really uh, extremely important topic. I said extremely important because this is one of the areas that uh, statistical thinking is still needed. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important point I want to make is in your list of all the future directions, that your example of the 100 year you know, record as one number very large reminds me of a very important problem, particularly maybe very, particularly vulnerable here, which is data quality issue. Right? And, um, you know, the, uh, when you have historical data, when you have 100 years data, the, the probability that some numbers are wrong. Extremely high. Yes. And, and, uh, and I think in this area, we're particularly vulnerable to, uh, to this, this kind of issue. When I was at the Chicago, I remember this was with my team and uh, their George team, uh, their Chicago team. You know, I, I learned from the scientists of that, that that these historical records, they have a law book, they have like 20 some errors that they would point out internally. You know, like, you know, data, uh, you know, digits are commuted, you know, decimal places are wrong, dates are wrong. Locations are wrong, they have all these different errors, right? Mm -hmm. and in this case, like, when I saw that particular very large number, I won't necessarily jump on to think that is a, you know, that is a true record. It could be a possibility of some, you know, Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Is there some way here, I understand doing the quantum regression, trying to be model free, trying to do, but is there some, some kind of scenario analysis you can do, for example, assume a bunch of uh, models to see and which model is possible to do that kind of number with one out of time probability to see whether those things are so extreme, whether basically your can be you know, a little bit more robust in the approach to this kind of uh, you know reporting error, which is historically what happened there. Thank, thank you very much for the, uh, the suggestion and the comment. That was our first in reaction as well when we see that data point and also see that uh, based on our analysis, the estimation of 100 year level is even smaller. So we thought, or is this due to input error, the 16.9 uh, inch precipitation? So that's why we looked back to the historical data, look at uh, multiple websites and uh, confirm that was really our record of uh, rainfall in our uh, station uh, area. Uh, but this is a very good uh, uh, suggestion, what you made regarding the robustness uh, and the uh, robustness of different, different models. So this is something that we, we can look into. And this is also connected to, I had a conversation with uh, Zhou Chen yesterday, and he also pointed out that the connection, the importance of extreme value theory in data privacy uh, issues, right? Those uh, extreme values, uh, extreme outliers and how do you preserve the privacy uh, in those uh, to pri the, the privacy of data without identifying because those extreme outliers it's yeah so it will be very easy to identify the identity and the single out the single observation or if we once we know the tail behavior extreme value index you can do extrapolation even if you hide the number perturb that single outlier number. 
just what, as what I just demonstrated with this data uh, downscaling example. Even we do not have the data point, if we use intermediate quantile information, we use extreme value theory, we can extrapolate, and then we can estimate that point. And then the identity of that single outlier, the person who makes the largest income, say, in, in this room, can be estimated. <laughs> so that will cause some uh, data privacy issue. And so this will also be a very interesting direction to, to look into. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah, thank you. Because if, if you model the, the quantiles in the tail area, you can invert it and really calculate the probability. And there's just due to this connection of a quantile and a probability, there are also some, some way or different approaches instead of modeling the quantile, but modeling the, the property or modeling the, the CDF, the, the distribution. So I have seen some work, it's not quantile regression, but distribution regression. <laughs> So that. Actually, so uh, in America, you motivate combination of quantile regression and the extremes because quantile regression is not stable when the probability level is too close to one. But when you estimate for pseudo order statistics, you nevertheless estimate the one which has the probability like one minus one over n. So would there be a natural upper bound? That upper yes. That's a very, very good question. So because that, that so has too much technical details, so for simplicity, I simplify the notations on my slides. But when we use those intermediate quantiles to estimate the, uh, the extreme value index Hill estimator, we actually did a truncation on the upper tail. We didn't use the maximum statistic uh, because we don't, we can, it, it's very hard to, to quantify the, the upper, the, largest statistic. So we did some truncation such that we only look at part of those intermediate quantiles, not towards the, to, to the, the nth order statistic, uh, so that we can still guarantee the, the, the theory, guarantee the validity of the method. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you. This, this is a the, uh, the very inspiring comment. I haven't looked at, uh, analyzed much of those negative uh, uh, or short-tailed distribution yet, but I know that endpoint is a very uh, important question in some application areas, and maybe we can talk more uh, in this uh, after the session. Any other question? Yeah. Hi. Yes. It's actually a very interesting question, and it definitely worth uh, further investigation. So when we compare different uh, models, right? So some may give you overestimation or more overestimation. Some may go, give you more underestimation. And so how can we take into the cost of those over underestimation uh, into consideration when deciding what model to 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 use or how to improve our models to to optimize? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, very interesting question. I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, if you like strain your quantiles um, on slide 30 and 31, would you have had the same issues that you were looking at? Or was that saying this is an unconstrained quantile and this is where our predictions were going? 
So can you elaborate more? What do you mean by constraint at 31? Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. So I mean, for that, we'll just, we we just pick the several quantile levels of interest that then fit regression. So there was no constraint. Um, so, so how do you constrain your, if you constrain your quantiles, yeah, yeah, yeah. you fix that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see, I see, I see. Right, but you, you have to come up with some reasonable constraints, what you know, and if you have some prior knowledge, you say that based on historical data, we don't think that in our station area, the precipitation can over go above 30 across you know, whatever value that is uh, given or output from the climate model, climate simulation model. Yeah, so certainly we can incorporate such constraints. So in certain areas, if the prior information is useful, is helpful, that constraint uh, regression estimation will give us more accurate so those, results. So those constraints could also limit your estimation yeah. of extreme values. Right, right. right. And how much like, variability in your choice of the constraint. Right. Yep. Yeah. Is that true? Yes, for instance, I mentioned that we had the earlier work that was to across avoid the quantile crossing, so we did a uh, joint estimation across the quantile levels, adding the constraints that upper quantile, so for a given covariate, has to be larger than the lower quantile functions. So this, that's due to more accurate estimation. Okay, I think it's a time for lunch, and we're gonna close the floor discussion, and you can congratulate Judy in person after this. Thank you, Judy, for the wonderful talk. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, once again.